My Monday's going pretty good. How about yours? Yeah, still. I, I didn't sleep well, but I'm, I'm here. I f I f I'm okay. <laughs> Monday's mostly mental, right? <laughs> um, so today we get to start chapter 15 on heat. But I'm going to do some clicker questions first on the uh, gases. So, some of the liquids, they overlap a lot since we, I meant to at the end of last time. Then, yeah, we'll start this temperature heat stuff. And chapter 16, we'll start on Friday with heat transfer, moving it around from one object to another or a different location. And then that's all we'll do with, uh, with heat. Then it's test time. But first, you get spring break. Yay! <laughs> So after this week, Sunday, your homework will be due on chapter 15. We won't have finished 16, so I won't ask you yet because you're going to forget it all over the spring break anyway. But the, sun, the first Sunday of spring break, you will have homework due. It's available now, if you've noticed. When we, the next Sunday we run into, which is this Sunday, yes. Good point. <laughs> so on the 9th, as listed on the calendar and on WebAssign, lest you try to remember this conversation and I still confuse you. <laughs> uh, then you get a nice break. We'll come back. I'll finish up 16 on Monday. We'll review Wednesday. Give you a chance to, oh yeah, that's right. And then we'll have an, an exam, not this Friday, but the Friday after spring break on uh, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Liquids, gases, heat, and heat transfer. Now this Friday, though, your superhero paper idea is due. Two of you have already sent it to me, so kudos to you. That sounds awesome. <laughs> uh, again, it's, it's, there's not much there. I just want to make sure you've ha you got an idea, you're working with it, you've looked a few things up, and emailing me that seems the simplest way so I can, okay, you're, you're on task. So that's by Friday. Uh, any questions you guys can think of? I have a question from last week. Yep. Um, I just wondered, yes, like what percentage of the electronic flame is caused by the heat of the support? 100. And does any casting reaction to the Oh, okay. So, so I failed. <laughs> no, that was my fault because I tried to emphasize that it could be explained either way. Oh, how much of the lift, is, whether it's just moving at a constant velocity or accelerating? The lift well, is... I just wondered if the percentage would be affected by that. Well, let me try this, see if this answers it. Lift can be 100% explained by Bernoulli's principle and lift in that sense, with uh, the fact that if the airplane's moving relative to the air, then, there, then there's a relative motion between them. There's a speed there. The corresponding drop in pressure is Bernoulli's principle. Now there's a difference in pressure between one side of the wing and the other side. That can cause lift. 100% can be explained. Newton's laws could 100% explain it also if you just looked at action-reaction. Usually aerodynamicists deal with Bernoulli's principle because they like conservation of energy. And a lot of people argue, no it's this, no it's this, and they don't realize that it can be explained completely with either. They usually just don't mix them. <laughs> now, whether it's moving at a constant speed or accelerating, I don't care, as long as it's moving. Because if, if the wing isn't moving, then there's no airflow across it, and you're not deflecting the air and scrunching the, the streamlines, you know, narrowing the pipe, and so there's no corresponding increase in air velocity or drop in pressure if you're just hold, holding still. Now they do the opposite in wind tunnels. You know, you can put the plane in a wind tunnel and move the air past it. Whoosh. But again, the air relative to the wing, there's still speed there. There's motion there. So you can still create lift by blowing the air across the wing or moving the wing through the air. Same effect. Is that helping? Did that help, Barbara? Oh, a little bit. Oh, well, give me more then, because I obviously...
It's a good question. <laughs> and it, it, for this course, it doesn't seem like it matters, does it? Uh, I think, well, let's just do this. You got a wing, and you got all these particles. Think of them as like little marbles. And they come and they hit the wing, and there's a collision. They, ref they bounce off. And so we can look at conservation of momentum, right? We can look at the angles and figure out, okay, if they come in at this speed and they go off at this speed at this angle, then we, we could figure out what speed this moves off at because we know its mass, we know their mass, and total momentum must be conserved, correct? I don't want to do that, though, because there's too many little particles and it'll take forever. <laughs> so most, like I said, aerodynamic engineers deal with Bernoulli's principle because you can do it in bulk. It's just the speed relative to the plane can, can give them the difference in pressure, and that, that pressure over the area of the wing can give them the force of lift. And in my mind, that's going to be shorter to do than dealing with all the individual particles and reactions and collisions. So that's a good, which brings me up to a good reminder again that with all these gases and liquids, and as we're going to get with heat, it's dealing with a bunch of microscopic atoms and molecules and particles, and everything we've learned up to here can apply to that. That's what causes these forces, collisions, the pressure. It just gets messy when you have that many little things that you can't see. So we've dealt with density and pressure instead of force to deal with it in bulk. And in my mind, that makes it easier to deal with. Any other questions? I didn't realize the uh, projector turns off when it's on mute. <laughs> Okay, well get your clickers out and we'll check some more of your understanding of this stuff. And the project projector's coming back on, so give it a minute. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the ranch. There you go, now you can log in. Start thinking of the first question. We'll see if there's any other holes in our thinking and or my teaching. <coughs> so the higher one goes in the atmosphere, the less the atmospheric pressure and or density of air. I won't lie, I'm hoping this is an easier one. <laughs> My follow-up question might not be, but we'll see. Let's get this first. <coughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I love how they still get in there right at the end. So most of you are claiming both of these. You're right. So let's help the few of you that are confused still. The higher up you go, there's just less and less air because eventually you end up in space, right? And so the, the density of air decreases because there's just less and less of it. So there's less to take up the same space. Does that make sense? Well, if there's less air then it, it's less dense. And remember, it's like jumping from salt water into fresh water. You go into something that's less dense. It doesn't push on you as hard. Or, or again, look at a column of water versus a column of mercury, which is going to be a greater pressure at the bottom for the same height. Mercury, water, same height. Who has more pressure? Mercury, because it's more dense. So things that are less dense would create less pressure. So there'll be less atmospheric pressure the higher up you go, too because there's less air. So my follow-up question, which I didn't put on here, I thought of it now, a hot air balloon, it goes up and up and up into the air, right? Fill it full of helium and it just goes up. Then what? What happens to it? Describe what you think happens to the hot air balloon as it goes up.
It'll stop? Why? The density of the helium will equal the density of the air. Which one's changing, the helium or the air? The air. Right. It goes up initially because if it's full of helium, it's less dense than the fluid it's in, right? Air. So, yeah, it floats. It goes up and up and up and up. But if the air gets less and less dense, at some point they're going to be the same density and it'll stop, right? Good. What else happens to the balloon, though, as it goes up? It expands. Why? Because there's less pressure. Higher up you go. The same pressure is trapped in the <coughs> balloon. So as it goes higher and higher up, there's a bigger difference. And so it expands because it's free to a balloon. But wait a minute. If something gets bigger, it's displacing more, a, a greater volume of air, isn't it? What's that do to the buoyant force? It increases it. If you displace more volume, you've got a bigger buoyant force. So shouldn't that make it go up faster and faster and faster? Because if you increase the buoyant force, remember it's the buoyant force and the weight that are fighting, right? And if the buoyant force is bigger, it's going to go up. The difference is the same force. There you go. We've got two things going on here. Because it expands, the buoyant force does increase. But the density has gone down. So, yeah, it takes up more volume. So if the air stayed the same, it would displace more air. But there's less and less air to displace because you're going up. And so, yeah, a hot air balloon would expand as it goes up, but eventually find an equilibrium if it doesn't expand too much and pop in the first place. Cool, huh? It, oh, yeah. They usually, if you inflate it full here and let it go up, well, it's going to expand and rupture. So they usually have them not fully <coughs> inflated, just enough to get it going up. And then they're very stretchy and strong, too. But <laughs> But typically, a, dip, a basic helium balloon, you know, you let kids let go of them, it's already inflated mostly. It goes up, it probably pops somewhere way up there, to, or it gets stuck in something. But. Good job. All right. Number So basically two tubes, one full of air, one full of water. When will they uh, be the same weight? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one. Meh. You remembered that number, didn't you? <laughs> but you don't understand it? <laughs> okay, so you got a, co a column of air and you got a column of water. Let's just jump to it. If the water is 10.3 meters, what's the pressure at the bottom? I'll rephrase because very good. Some of you are thinking better. Just due to the water, what's the pressure at the bottom? One, One atmosphere, because that's the height of water that matches the pressure of atmosphere. So that's why 10.3 meters of water creates one atmosphere of pressure, where the air itself creates one atmosphere of pressure. So yeah, you would need air 30 kilometers up, that's our atmosphere, and just 10.3 meters of water to create by themselves the same pressure. And you know why, because air is a whole lot less dense in the water. But you're, you're right. About weight, not right. So the fact that they're, uh, uh, you know, this didn't say identical. Two tubes. Okay, they should be identical. The idea is if they have the same weight, they're over the same area, they'll create the same pressure. Or look at it the other way. If they create the same pressure over the same area, it's, that's the weight needed. They, they thought it should say identical. But yeah, absolutely, the pressure at the bottom of 10.3 meters of water is technically two atmospheres because you've got the air on top of you and the water. 
So I heard that over here. Good. How do you get rid of that uh, the atmospheric pressure from air? How do you get rid of it? You got any uh, solutions? Uh, closing it. You, know, you, can't, you can't go in a room and just close a door. It was I mean, already full of air. The air. There you go. You need a vacuum pump. You'd have to pull it out. That's what we do. Do you remember my balloon? I did it over here in a bell jar. Somebody answer me. <laughs> you remember that? So I, what I did is I pulled the air out. And so I dropped the pressure in, inside the bell jar, outside of the balloon. The pressure inside the balloon was atmospheric pressure to begin with. It was trapped. So now the inside is greater pressure than the outside, and it expanded. That was Boyle's law, pressure, volume. If you drop the pressure by half, the volume goes up by twice, double. <coughs> All right, why do pumps work? Liquid pumps. Point of a pump is to move the liquid. What what makes the liquid move? Differences in what? Pressure, density, viscosities, or energies? Ten, nine, eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Most of you want to go with A. Good. I've been trying to emphasize that we really only notice this stuff when there's differences in pressure. If so, there's high pressure here and low pressure here, that's what gets it moving. That's what a pump does. Just increases the pressure on one side so it'll move. <coughs> Same with air, because that's a fluid. And that's how our weather works. You know, high pressure fronts and low pressure fronts, our weather, it's because there's differences in pressure, and that creates wind, and moves things around. Okay. I won't lie. Think a little harder than normal on this one. Don't reckon any of you have ever tried this. I have. <laughs> Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, most of you think it's B. Let me. This is this is tricky. But I hope that once I explain it here, it'll make more sense. Of course, you're reading it. Let's see. A helium-filled balloon is able to float only because its volume increases enough to displace its own weight of surrounding air. Stop. Well, that's the buoyant force. It displaces so much air. We weigh that air. That creates the buoyant force. Remember Archimedes' principle? Buoyant force is the weight of the displaced fluid. Okay. And that's the buoyant force. So if that, it displaces enough air to make this force big enough to counter its weight, sure enough, it goes up. You got that, right? So... The steel tank has a fixed volume. The more helium pumped into it just makes it heavier. So it's fixed volume. It has, that displaces so much air. That creates the buoyant force. Is it enough to make it float? No. When you put more air into it, does it displace more air? I mean, when you put more helium into it, does it displace more air? No, because the volume's fixed. So it's the same buoyant force. You're just cramming more and more helium into it. What are you doing to the density of the helium? 
you're increasing it. And if you increase the density of the object, there's no way it's going to float. You'd have to lessen it, right? Does that make sense now? So yeah, helium's really light, you know. There's not much mass to it, but it still has mass. So just shoving more and more in is just, it really just makes it heavier and heavier. Tricky, huh? But I, I've, I've seen people attempt this because they think it'll work. <laughs> for whatever reason they needed to do it. I don't know. Oh, that was, oh, right. I was in uh, the polling software when I hit escape instead of PowerPoint, so. <coughs> Let's go back to polling and do some more. Okay, now that I'm in there, I wasn't done. Okay. Go. I've kind of reviewed this already, so let's see. I haven't been in a hot air balloon. I go to hot air balloon festivals because I, I, I like taking pictures. And it's, it's fun. But I've never been in one. I think it'd be fun. I don't know if I'd get my wife to go, but I'll go. My daughter will go, that's for sure. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. There's always somebody that waits till the last moment. All right. Wow, no question. B, good. You got that. And I had one more I want to ask you. You're not responding as fast as I thought you would, so your clue is, this is Bernoulli's principle. After this question, could you go over that formula again and how one variable affects... Oh, the equation? Yeah, yeah. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Meh. All right, two-thirds of you think it'll decrease. That's right. That's just, that is just straight Bernoulli's principle. That if a, a fluid can find there. As it speeds up, there's a corresponding drop in pressure. The reverse is true, too. If the pressure drops, it's going to speed up. That was the uh, little Venturi tube over here. What was his name? You know, where it started out in a bigger area and then got smaller. So it, had, it started moving faster, there was a corresponding drop in pressure, and we saw the liquid raise up, because the atmospheric pressure was pushing it harder than it was pushing. Aren't there like when people have like faucets or showers, they're always like, you either have good or bad water pressure? Ah, you can put your clickers away. Well, what determines pressure, one is, simplistically, the pump at the power plant, <laughs> or water plant, or the water tower. The higher the water tower, the more pressure created down here. But also, how many houses are being used, or are being supplied? You know, four houses versus 40. Think of it that way. You have this pressure acting on a certain area, four houses. It's a smaller area, isn't it? But they all get the same pressure. Where if you spread it out over 40, do you see how it's not going to squirt as fast? It's like you're all sharing it. It's spread over a bigger area. But it, it's the, the power plant that provides the pressure. And that's up to them or the water tower they're using to get it in the first place. Also, as you travel lengths, if the water plant's really far away, you lose energy. 
Uh, total energy is conserved, but remember how we can't just roll a ball and it will just keep rolling forever? Why? Friction. With fluids, there's friction. You've heard of the term viscosity? That's essentially friction for fluids. So in t you know, when it runs into the inside walls of the, of the pipe, and also amongst itself, they're hitting each other, there's friction, and some of this energy is converted to heat and lost from the system. It's no longer in part of the water, you know, so it, it slows down. And so if you, you're trying to pump really, really far, the pressure's not going to be as big at the end as it was when you started. That's another reason. Ah, if it was completely enclosed, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a hydraulic lift where, you know, you, you got it in there, it's all filled, and you just give a little push here, and it, yeah. Yeah. So that equation that I wrote up here was essentially there was something associated with kinetic energy. One half times the density velocity squared. This was in your book. I think it was a footnote, though. Just so you can uh, reference it later. Yeah, it's at the bottom of page 256. So that's, there's energy associated with motion. There's energy associated with uh, position. And we started with this, I mean, that, that's pressure. Remember we, di we divided these by volume, so they're all like pressure terms now. But the gist here is we're conserving energy. So this is a pressure, this is a pressure, and this is a pressure. And that has to stay constant, ideally. The total energy, thus pressure, would stay constant. But again, I mean, I can emphasize now, Kinetic, potential, and the pressure, that's all we're considering here. Total energy is always conserved. So if some is, turns into heat, we're not accounting for that. And so one, the, one of these goes down. That's usually the pressure. If you're just moving it along slowly at a, st a straight pipe, can you see that if some of it escapes due to friction and heat, then there'll be less pressure at the end. Just because some of it transformed into a form of energy that we're not considering here. This is Bernoulli's equations. This is what it considers. And it's just, so yeah, if this speeds up, you can look at it this way too. If these were all like velocity one, position one, pressure one, then you have velocity two, position two, pressure two. So like at one point, you have all these values. And somewhere else down the line, you have another point. And you can get differences in pressure, can't you? If the pressure drops, there's going to be a corresponding increase in speed, vice versa. If you are up high and you go down low, they ship. This one changes. So something else gives. You've increased the pressure. Or you're in a hose. You're, you're under a lot of pressure right now, and then it escapes to atmospheric pressure. So the pressure drops. And if the pressure drops, Bernoulli's principle, there's a corresponding increase in speed, and the water shoots out really fast. So this is just a big scary way of summing it all up. It was a footnote, but I figure you guys could handle it. Because <laughs> you've dealt with kinetic energy, potential energy, and this pressure thing now. So any more questions on that? I got one more thing I think is cool. Uh, I don't even remember if this is in the book. It won't take long. Will you help me, Tommy? Okay. Let's see how many breaths it takes to fill this up. Blow. Yeah, blow into it. <laughs> One. Two. Three. Okay, we'll stop. This is taking too long. <laughs> All right, you take that in. Ready? <laughs> This is my superhero power. <gasps> <laughs> this is called entrainment. Entrainment. And it works though because this 
So, you know, I didn't tell you, and most people do. They just put their mouth up to it. And, well, the only air you can get into the bag is the air you filled your lungs with. So it's going to take a while. Well, I didn't really cheat. What I did, though, is I backed off like this, and I blew air out of my lungs into it. But the air's moving, isn't it? So what's the corresponding change? There's less pressure in, internally in the fluid. That's Bernoulli's principle. And so if there's less pressure here, and there's atmospheric pressure out here, what's that going to cause? Right. The atmosphere is pushing air into the low pressure region. And so when I do this, not only does my air go in, but it pulls in surrounding air. And so you can actually get more volume into there. And it looks more impressive, doesn't it? Thanks, Tommy. They uh, made a fan. They have a big one, but it's too much money. I didn't buy it. It's called a bladeless fan. Have you seen these? I mean, it's not awesome, but it works. <laughs> and the point is, there's no blades. Well, that's something I like, too. There's blades, but they're inside spinning, really small. And it blows air. There's like an opening around here, and it blows air out. Well, that's like me blowing into the bag. So it's not blowing very fast, but it pulls surrounding air out. So it, you can get a, a significant increase in volume of air. This only blows a little bit of air itself, but it pulls more air in. And so it, it's quite significant. I mean, you know, it's meant to be when you're hot in the summer waiting for the fireworks to go, right? But you can see it gets, pu gets pulled in, too. But it's a lot stronger here because... The volume is greater there. It's pulled more air in top of what it's blowing. You follow me? They make a bigger version of this, like this big for tabletop. Uh, someday I'm going to get one, but not yet. So just a practical application. It's called entrainment. And uh, it works because of this Bernoulli's principle. Another thought is uh, prairie dog holes, you know? Little prairie dogs pop up in their mounds or ground, whatever you want. Marmots. Well, think if the wind's blowing, you know, they got a tunnel they can get to and from, right? But the wind's blowing, what happens? Wind blows over something and it gets deflected, right? It narrows here. Say again? Decrease in pressure. Yeah, the air is actually right here, going to flow faster. And there's a corresponding drop in pressure here compared to here. The difference in pressure causes air to flow through the tunnel. Keeps them cool. You can get an airflow through the tunnel that way. If they were the same height, there'd be no difference in pressure. Oh, boy, that'd get hot and stagnant in there. So, I mean, I don't know if they know this, but <laughs> that's what they do. I mean, innately, they know this. But another application. Your umbrella, right? When the wind blows over the umbrella, same idea. It constricts the region there, so it speeds up. Corresponding drop in pressure above the umbrella. Atmospheric pressure below. You got lift. And that's why... It, wants to go away sometimes. Same with houses. I grew up in Kansas with tornadoes. And if the wind's blowing really fast across the top of your roof, well, same thing's going to happen. The roof actually wants to lift off. And you can find many houses, unfortunately, especially in trailer parks, yeah, where the roof's gone. It's how it's built. In many regions, it's easier just to set it on there, the weight, you know, and they just kind of secure it. Well, not in Kansas. They shouldn't. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's bolted down. <laughs> it should be. Yeah. Yes, except you never know which way the wind's coming or the tornado's coming. But you have to, like, shield your whole thing. Yeah. But same with windows, too. They always tell you, you go in the basement, you know, and you're... 
<laughs> and you stay away from windows. Because window, if, if uh, the air is moving really fast on the outside, there's a drop in pressure there. Pressure is in, higher inside, it can blow windows out. They'll shatter, and you don't want any backlash. Or whatever. You don't want sucked out either. All right, you ready for heat? Okay. Me too. This is a hot topic. So, I grew up in Kansas, and there's lots of uh, grain silos. And I still remember my dad worked at a chemical plant, and we had, it was like the second largest grain silo in the United States, I think. It exploded. Basically, uh, powder, lots of powders, wheat, you know, oat or whatever, isn't flammable. But if you spread it out into really, really fine dust, so the surface area is increased, you know, a hundredfold compared to its volume, then it can catch on fire. There's a lot less mass per particle. But instead of being one clump, they, it can all get to the little bits, and so now they can burn fast enough to sustain a flame. Well, if that dust in the grain silo gets ignited because someone's being silly and, and sparks something, or heaven forbid there's smoke in near one, then yeah, whammo. It ignites, and what do you think happens to the pressure contained in the silo? It increases. Well, that's where we're getting to. What do you think all those particles start doing when they get lit? They start moving faster. People naturally know that. And they start pushing on the walls more. They hit them more often. That's a force on an area. It increases the pressure. And if it's too much, yeah, whammo. You just created a bomb. I'm not going to do the bomb part, but the, the flash is fun. So this is a cornstarch. And it's not flammable by itself, but if I blow it out so I can spread it, we'll see if I can ignite it. You ready? You know what? This is... Let's do that. I've learned if you're going to go home and try this, do it outside. But take your, your inhalation breath first. No, seriously, this stuff... <laughs> <laughs> so, if that was all contained in a <laughs> yeah, pressure increases and it's, it'll explode. <laughs> <It's> great. <laughs> that make it worse? <laughs> oh well. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, if I just do a, you do a small flame, often it'll blow the flame out. So just over a candle or probably a bit, it would probably blow it out and not be as impressive. The faster you can get it out too and spread out, the more impressive it'll be. You can go YouTube this. Some silly people have done this. Mythbusters have done this. My favorite is a, a quick release high pressure valve. They had like a thing of sawdust, like this tall, and they threw a safety flare in the top so then they get way way back and one reason I thought they were dumb is because they're in the grass with all these trees around them I'm like no nah, this isn't and of course they release all the air really fast it blows all the sawdust up just like this and yeah you can see it it's just one big fireball higher in the trees but yeah it works so we can learn lots from this <laughs> sparks but it doesn't hurt me because there's a difference between out of this unit and you fail the test at least remember this temperature and heat are not the same thing uh, the book uses sparklers as an example these sparks are very hot they have a high temperature. I mean, they're glowing, right? They must be hot. They are. But they don't contain much heat. 
because there's not much mass to them. You know, I have a lot more mass than they do. And there's this energy transfer thing we're going to get to. It doesn't harm me. Is defined as the measure of average translational kinetic energy per molecule of a substance. And basically what that says is atoms and molecules, they're always wiggling and jiggling, right? <laughs> they're moving. They have kinetic energy. They also have potential energy. They're bound to atoms, their position. They also, like here's a water molecule. So they're moving around. They change their position. They can rotate. They got rotational energy. They got vibrational energy stored in the spring. All that energy is called internal energy. Up till now, I might have called it thermal internal energy. It's the total something. It could be kinetic, potential, nuclear, all that kind of stored in it. But temperature is only a measure of one thing. It's this translational kinetic energy. And it's on average. Because all the particles aren't moving the same. Some at, some, at any instant, can be moving faster. But this one might be moving slower. Think of it. It's a bunch of collisions. Picture a bunch of billiard balls or marbles. At one point, this one might be moving slowly. But then another guy comes and hits him, right? Boom! And it makes him go faster. <coughs> But then he collides with somebody else that was, that's coming at him, right? And he slows down. And then he gets sped up and slowed down, you know? Just picture a mosh pit you know, <laughs> at a concert. Sometimes you're going faster than you want, and other times you're, you're, you're at a standstill. So individually, the particles are too hard to keep track of. And they can have a wide range of kinetic energies. So on average... We, we consider a kinetic energy. And it's just the translational, which means this, again. If it moves, it's displaced. Causes it to move. The energy is stored with this, rotational. It does not a measure of temperature. So if you make a water molecule do this, it doesn't get hotter. This by itself. Or vibrational, bouncing back and forth. Blah, 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 blah. That's not a measure of temperature. Do you know that's how microwaves work, though? The microwaves get absorbed by a water molecule. This is just a representation of it. <laughs> and it makes them start going like this. It, g it gives them uh, mostly rotational energy. But that doesn't increase the, the food's temperature. Well, what do you think it does to its neighbors when it, when it hits them? Yeah, it knocks it, and then they start translating and moving. That gives them translational kinetic energy. And if you take the average of all those, that will heat it up. That's the temperature. Does that make sense? You can have a more complicated molecule, too. And they can be jiggling. They can be rotating. But it's the translational that matters. Think of this. What happens when you take liquid water and you cool it down? Yeah, first it starts going slower, right? And slower and slower and slower. When it freezes, does it stop moving all together? Yeah, the translational is getting uh, slowed down, decreased. Yeah, and then it freezes, right. While it, what, what, at what temperature does water freeze? <laughs> you probably already knew this, right? Yeah, zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees <coughs> Fahrenheit. Um, while it's freezing, though, its temperature doesn't change. Do you guys remember that? It gets to zero and then it freezes, turns into ice, and then can keep getting colder. So what's happening while its temperature's not changing? It's not being slowed down. What do you think's happening? Where's that energy going? Yeah, it's this energy. The molecular bonds. Think of it the other way. It might make more sense. You put ice on a burner under a flame, and the ice starts to melt at zero degrees Celsius. While it's melting, the bonds are breaking. You're changing the internal energy, but you're not changing the temperature. Are you with me? But once it turns into water, now it can gain translational kinetic energy. It starts moving faster and faster and faster and gets hotter and hotter and hotter until it becomes steam, and then it 
when water is turning into steam, boiling, its internal energy is increasing, but its temperature is not. Then once it's steam, they can get going faster and faster again. Does all this really harp on you the difference between these three terms here? So that's just a measure of average translational kinetic energy. Those three terms are important. I don't want you to get confused when I ask questions. And you got internal energy. So what the heck is this heat? That's the energy that's transferred from one object to another. When you put ice on above the flame, the flame has internal energy. The ice has internal energy. And heat will transfer from the flame to the ice. That's called heat. Think of heat as energy in transit. Do you remember how work, we, we'd say an object does not possess work? It can't have work. It has the ability to do work or to be worked on. Likewise, we said objects don't possess force. Guy can't say, I have force. No, I have mass and inertia, and I can change my motion. I can be pushed or pushed on. So the same idea with heat. Objects don't possess heat. That's energy in transit, when it'll transfer from one object to another. And the only time that happens is when there's a change in temperature, a difference in temperature between the two objects. So everybody take, take your, your hands, touch the wood on your, t on your chair, and touch the metal with your other hand. So your, one hand's on metal, one hand's on wood. Which one's hotter? The wood. Wrong. They're actually at the same temperature. Because they're in the room, they've come to equilibrium with the room. This is something called specific heat capacity, which it looks like we'll get to next time. That's fine. Each material will transfer energy at different rates. In this case, we'd say wood has more resistance, thermal re inertia, if you will. So think of this specific heat capacity as thermal inertia. It wants to resist changing its energy, or temperature, I should say. Either way, giving it up. So when you touch the wood, well, and most things are, are hotter than your, your chair probably. So because you're hotter than the wood, heat will flow because there's a difference in temperature. And you need to know that heat always and only flows naturally from a hot object to a colder. You'll never find heat flowing from a cold object to a hot object naturally, all on its own. So heat will flow from you, out of you, into the wood and into the metal. But because the wood and metal are different materials, they have different thermal inertia, different heat, specific heat capacity. And where that energy goes is different. The wood doesn't pull it out of you as fast. So where's that energy going? Internally into the wood somehow. The metal... It pulls it out of you really fast, so there's a lot more heat being transferred to the metal. Anyway, that, that's heat. It's energy in transit. Let me just do this. Call it good. So you can visualize this as you start reviewing this. Here's a bunch of BBs. They're on a, a speaker that can vibrate. So I'll turn it up and start vibrating it. Think of these as atoms or molecules of a substance. And you can see they start jiggling. That's natural. Things are always in motion. Even when they get colder, they're still in motion. They're just moving with less average translational kinetic energy, but they're still moving. If I add heat, transfer heat to this by turning up the volume, making it wiggle more. Think of it as like putting it under a flame. You know what happens. See, they start moving more. They have, an, on average, a greater translational kinetic energy. So we'd say the temperature went up. You keep going. And look also, they're hitting the sides more often, aren't they? More impacts, more collisions. That's going to increase the pressure. And so pressure is related to temperature as well as volume. That was that ideal gas law. If you put a little uh, 
uh, lid on this. It's heavy. You can see it smushes it a little. If I decrease the pressure by lessening the, the heat input, I'm going to turn the volume down. You see it doesn't push it as hard. Increase the heat, the temperature goes up, and it pushes harder on that, and the volume expands, because this one's free to. All right, any last minute questions? Okie doke, see you later.